You're moving towards evidence-based orthopedics. You have nothing to lose. So we just must jump into this and only evidence to gain. But what's the problem? What's the state of the orthopedic literature in 2010? Well, the majority of our literature, as you can imagine, is case theories. We have very few RCTs. Here we create this ladder of randomized trials, but we're not following it. We're not developing the trials that we need. And why? Lots of reasons. Could be the culture is lagging, the harder to do, we don't have experience in the structure, funding is a major problem, and ultimately there may not be a need to do this. Something else we have in orthopedics that our colleagues who do drug trials don't. Drug, drugs are very different than devices. When drugs are, are regulated by the FDA in the United States, they have to go through a series of randomized trials. However, for a particular device, there's a mechanism through the FDA called the 510K mechanism. Basically all that means is you can develop a nail or a plate. You can prove that it looks the same and performs the same biomechanically as an existing plate on the market, and you can market it immediately without ever putting it into a patient. What's this led to us is a different hierarchy. So for drugs, we, we focus on randomized trials, but for devices, um, we're focusing on experimental data. That's a real potential gap. We also think of the product marketing cycle as being the complete reverse or the inverse um, of the evidence cycle. The evidence cycle, we say we ask questions, we acquire information, we appraise the evidence, and then we act on the patient. In the product marketing cycle, we develop a product and we immediately act. And we put it into patients. And then we start asking questions later. And if things happen or there's a problem, we will pull that, that particular market or that product off the market. And in fact, one in four devices are pulled from the market within five years. And we've recently seen what's happening with the metal and metal devices that are resurfacing. But this is not new. I mean, these are cyclical things that have occurred time and time again. And I'm sure many of you uh, can, in your own practice, can cite products that came and went uh, through your course of your training. So in the universe of orthopedic trials, the quality generally is not so great. You look at everything out there. So that's a problem. So even uh, you know, across the globe where, where we're running these trials, it's still problematic. So where do these trials go wrong? What's the problem? Well, if you want to limit bias in orthopedic research, again, bias limiting uh, factors are those that improve validity, or you have to randomize patients, ensure that randomization is concealed, blind anyone you can blind, or at least have somebody independent of the operating surgeon evaluate the results and achieve follow, follow your patients. But the absolute fundamental concept that I think often gets misunderstood time and time again is randomization and selling. Surgeons typically involved in the study randomizing a patient to either treatment A or treatment B. It seemed very simple, but if I were to go around this room and ask people what their definition of randomization was, many of you would come up with multiple different viewpoints on this particular very fundamental concept. So why is it that we randomize? What's the purpose of doing this? The purpose of randomizing is to achieve a balance, a balance of prognosis. We want the patients to be similar with respect to known prognostic factors and those that we even don't know about. But we want a balance of prognosis except for one thing, the intervention itself. So if we see a difference between the intervention and the control, we can attribute it to the intervention and not some other comorbidity or other problem that might be different between the patient groups. So we typically look at these types of tables that have a group A and a group B, and we look to make sure they're similar. But again, the power of randomization is that it looks beyond what we thought might be important, and along all those other factors that we didn't think about. Those also get balanced as the unknown factors in randomization. More important than randomization itself is the fact that it should be concealed, another fundamental concept in improving research quality. Investigators should not be able to determine the treatment allocation of the next patient in a trial. What does that mean? Is that when you read papers and they talk about a randomized trial and they talk about using envelopes to randomize patients, I'm sure many of you have seen that, you can imagine that if there is a way to quote unquote cheat, uh, human nature is such that we will do that. So what can you do to envelopes? Well, if you're in the middle of the night and you really want to do an open procedure, you can put that envelope to the light Keep putting as many envelopes to the light until you find the open procedure and pull that one as your quote unquote <laughs> random allocation. And this happens <laughs> lots. You can also just keep opening envelopes and throwing the ones that don't, you don't like into the garbage until you figure out the treatment that you like and put it in. These are all things that have been done and are problematic. 
So we have to think of ways in which we can, what we call, conceal randomization. The only way to do that is to do it through what we're now using internet-based randomization schemes or telephone mix, but it must be something that does not allow the investigators themselves to open or tamper with the process itself. Something else I think we always worry about is how do you do a randomized trial that's blinded? That's why our, our cardiology colleagues always say, well, you can't do blinded trials. Well, we tried that once, and we tried to do a blinded trial in a uh, total hip replacement. I'll tell you how blinded it <laughs> So two things you have to remember when you're doing a blinded trial. You need a very good assistant. This is a surgeon who's going to do a total hip replacement. <laughs> and you can see he started at the knee. But the assistant, there you go. You put him right in the right spot. So we clearly realize that you cannot do blinded surgical trials. But what can be blind? Who can be blind? Well, you can blind at least the outcome assessor time to time. You can blind patients or the data analysts. So remember that there are lots of other groups that can be blinded in these trials. And we're not going to forget about those particular groups. Something else that we always use, we always talk about the concept of the elephant in the room. Well, the elephant in the room for every major study is sample size. How many patients do we need? Uh, and you've seen, again, in my earlier discussion this morning, that patients in trials of 40 patients can be very misleading. So we have to think about you know, increasing our numbers. In fact, if you look at the orthopedic trauma trials, 9 out of 10 trials that say there were no difference between two treatments were actually possibly falsely negative. In other words, they were underpowered. They had what we call a beta error, which basically means that they weren't big enough. That's a big problem. I suspect that this problem isn't just in trauma. It's in spine, it's in arthroplasty, it's in sports, it's in every aspect of orthopedics. 80% of spine trials risk having false negative findings. That's a big problem. And that's an issue of not enough patients. So one thing I think, I'm sure you're thinking about in the Philippines is we have more than enough patients. So there's no reason why these trials can't occur and why you can't be highly successful um, where others have not been. But something I want to raise with you is that sample size is important, but what we're really after is something, again, very fundamental. I'm going to give you two examples here. Let's look at a study, and I want you to think to yourself, which one would you believe more if you were presented this? You have a study of 200 patients, in which the treatment, in this case, let's say it's a new biological treatment that, to help fracture healing, suggests that in, when you give the biologic, only one out of 100 patients needs a reoperation against a control, where 9 out of 100 patients need a reoperation. That basically turns out to a p value of 0.02, which is significant, and also suggests that you can reduce the risk of having a reoperation by 89% with this new novel therapy. I think many of you would think this is pretty important. Now, let's say we have another trial, 2,000 patients. And again, this particular suggests that the new novel biologic will reduce the risk of having a surgery, a repeat surgery, by 44%. We have a p-value. My feeling is that, again, if I were to ask for a show of hands, the majority of us would be compelled to believe that the green box is the one. And you might look at the p-value and say the p-value is smaller, and therefore that's the most important. But I caution you, the p-value tells you nothing about the importance. So remember, the p-value tells you nothing about the importance of this study. What you should be looking at isn't even the number of patients, which is large. You should look at the number of outcomes. There are 90 and 50 outcomes, 140 combined outcomes. In this case, reoperations in green versus 10. Why is that important? Well, think to yourself, if this trial was repeated and repeated and repeated, what's the likelihood that we would come up with one and nine again? Probably we wouldn't. And in fact, the next time we did it, we might actually come up with something like this. 3 out of uh, 100 and 7 out of 100. There's a few different outcomes might like flip back and forth. That's just the randomness of doing research. The random error we talk about, the chance of having it. But look what happens in a small study when you do that. You completely lose all significance. It, it's no longer a significant finding. What happens when a few events switches and you have lots of events? Not much. You stable and you keep your findings the same. So we will be caught. we talk about this concept of maintaining stability of your findings. If just changing a few of the outcomes back and forth can completely reverse your findings, that's a problem. And I say to you that the majority of our orthopedic literature is the red box, where a few events, one way or the other, can completely change the findings, which makes it very, very uh, suspect, which makes it very dangerous to apply new uh, 
practice is based on that finding. 